Thanks, everybody. Hope you're all having a great day so far. My name is Tyler Taba. I'm the Director of Resilience at the Waterfront Alliance. Um, so we're here today with a great panel to talk about stormwater utilities, funding opportunities. We'll talk a little bit about fees, um, and we'll try to give you a good, well-rounded New York, New Jersey picture. And we also have, are lucky to have a speaker from DC to give us a little bit more of an understanding of how these things are happening across the nation. So. Um, like I said, I'm Tyler, I'm the Director of Resilience. I help lead our policy and advocacy work at Waterfront Alliance. Um, and this is an area that we've been working on advocating for for the last couple of months, I would say, but there's organizations who have been doing this for much longer than us. Um, so I'll, I'll let those folks introduce themselves. Ivan, if you wanna go first. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ivan Boykin. I am the Vice President of Finance at DC Water and Sewer Authority. Hello, y'all. My name is Lee Clark. I'm the program manager for New Jersey Futures uh, Funding Navigator Program located in New Jersey. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Dulong. I'm a legal program director with Hudson Riverkeeper. We protect the Hudson from source to sea, so from New York City all the way up to Albany and beyond. We do a lot of work here in New York City on sewage and stormwater reduction. Awesome. Okay, so we can go ahead and get started. I may ask Jake, do you mind closing those back doors just as, yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> Okay, great. So just to kick us off, I wanted to do a quick, very like one minute or 30 second introduction. Let's see if these slides are working. Yes, okay, so of the climate risk that we are facing and why this panel is important and why this conversation is important. So <clears throat> here is two maps of New York and New Jersey from Rebuild by Design's Atlas of Disaster. If folks are not familiar with this resource, it's a great tool. Um, it actually shows you where disaster declarations have occurred across all 50 states, they're working on reporting them on all 50 states, and we have these two here for New York and New Jersey. And you can see that every single, wow, that's so much better. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> um, you can see that every single county in both states have ha has had a disaster declaration, a flood disaster declaration in the last 10 years alone, many counties. I know in New York, we have over 60 counties have had more than five flood disaster declarations. And as you all know, not every county in New York is a coastal county, so it's not just storm surge, it's not just um, uh, high tides that are the risk anymore. We're seeing a lot of inland flooding across the state, even here in, in the city, and it's the same case for New Jersey and really across the rest of the nation. This slide is observed and projected change in extreme rainfall across the nation, and you can see that actually in the top right corner, that's the northeast region of the U.S., that is the, that's the region of the country with the greatest expected rate of increased precipitation. Um, so this is these, these storms that we're seeing that are coming in with heavy rainfall over a short amount of time, that is sort of the new normal. Um, Hurricane Ida was an example of that that really set us um, made us aware of what those, I think, Im impacts can, can be when they're really bad, but it's also happening on unnamed, regular, just storm events now. And so how do we start to think about um, managing for that extreme rainfall risk? And so I'll, I'll pass it actually over to Mike to talk a little bit about some of the ways that sewer water is managed currently, and I'll start with this slide here that shows the combined sewer overflow areas in New York City. Great. Well. Uh I don't know how many people know this, but New York City has the worst sewage problem, the combined sewer overflow problem in the country. Um, on a day like today, New York City has enough <coughs> treatment capacity to treat all of the sanitary sewage that's coming from your bathrooms, your sinks, from industrial sites. Uh, but when it rains, um, in these areas of the city um, where there are combined sewers, that stormwater runs off roofs and sidewalks and streets. It combines with that sanitary sewage, overwhelms the system, and it discharges. It discharges in 450 locations throughout the city. It happens on about one out of every three days somewhere in the city they're discharging. And it's to the tune of 21 billion gallons a year, which we say is 72 Empire State Buildings full, to give you uh, <laughs> a little bit of a picture of what that looks like. It's a lot of sewage and stormwater, and it, it's a tremendous problem. And I think we have the MS4 map. Yep, right. uh, on, in these areas, um, the, the sewers are separated, so they don't have that problem, but polluted stormwater runoff poses its own problems and has to be managed. And so to bring New York City's waters into compliance with the Clean Water Act, uh, the DEC commissioner said it would cost about $110 billion, billion with a B. This, this is a very expensive problem, very expensive uh, system to deal with. And so obviously funding is a, a key uh, issue for New York City. How do we fund infrastructure to deal with this? Yeah, and maybe you could talk for just a minute, Mike, about some of that difficulty for New York City to incentivize green infrastructure on private property. I won't go to the rate 
slide just yet, but if you want to just preface it, and then we'll go to Ivan and Lee to talk about how those similarities might exist in New Jersey and in D.C. Right, sure. So New York City is doing a, a really great job in the public right-of-way of designing green infrastructure, um, building green infrastructure out to capture uh, stormwater before it makes its way into that combined sewer system, so it, it reduces the amount of overflow. Uh, it also has all kinds of um, ancillary benefits for communities, green space, um, and all of that. It does not do so well in incentivizing private owners, private landowners, to implement any kind of stormwater controls on their property. It has some stormwater rules, um, but nobody's taking advantage of the incentives right now. So, so that's been a, a sticking point for the city. And in private ownership, we're talking maybe 60, 70 percent of the land. And so maybe I'll pass it off to Ivan or Lee, whichever, to start off and talk about maybe how you see some of that similarity about challenging with financing for stormwater infrastructure in, in your respective geographies. Okay. I'll start it <laughs> off. Uh, for D.C. Water, uh, the funding uh, has been not enough. Um, our program is not as large as New York City, you know, with $110 billion. Uh, ours is a roughly around, uh, it started off, our Clean Rivers program, which was our long-term control plan, started off at around 2.6 billion, but it is now estimated at around 3.3. Uh, and again, there is just not enough federal funding um, for us. Uh, it started back in, I believe, in the 1990s when uh, there was a lawsuit uh, filed by environmentalists. You know, they uh, came after uh, us to state, well, the district and D.C. Water to state that um, we were polluting the. Uh, we were, we were in violation of the CSOs. So basically it just came down to, uh, there was a federal mandate where we needed to clean the rivers. And that's where it basically just came to that point of, again, having an estimated cost, we worked with consultants, rate consultants, to make sure we could recover the cost for our program. But uh, again, uh, our total, total source of funding annually, we receive less than 5% from the federal government. So, I mean, and 40% of our program is funded uh, through financing by issuing bonds. So it is a, it is a very, very uh, difficult challenge that we are facing uh, in the District of Columbia. Yes. Um, ooh, that's loud. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I agree with that. Now, I don't know where y'all are from, but depending on where y'all are from, New Jersey's either one of the greatest states ever or just that <laughs> weird space between New York City and Philadelphia, all right? <laughs> But what, regardless how you look at it, we do need more funding when it comes to water infrastructure. I can tell you that right now. Uh, just like Mike was saying, because we're in the Northeast, we have some of the oldest water infrastructure in the entire country. Some of our pipes going back to the 1800s, some of which are made out of wood, which is embarrassing in the 21st century. But we do need more funding. In my nonprofit, New Jersey Future, we work with partners, national, regional, local to find funding to do this, and we try to work with the government as well. Now, we're all familiar with the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law and the, Ameri um, the American Rescue Plan, which injected an unprecedented amount of federal funds into uh, states and localities in order to try to rectify much of this damage that's been going through our water infrastructure. But as we're clearly finding out, we need more funding from the federal government because we can only put so much on a, the local taxpayers and um, on the state as well, because these problems are just huge. I mean, New Jersey alone, it's a problem that goes over a billion dollars if you're looking at the entire water infrastructure for repairs. So one of the things that my organization is working with through my program, the Funding Navigator, we work with um, local partners, we work with local um, elected officials and local officials as well on the government level, uh, but we focus mostly on water and drinking utilities. Uh, public ones at that to try to help infuse uh, technical assistance to help them get through the SRF, which is the state revolving fund for drinking water and clean water, and also identify low interest loans and grants through both the federal and state level. We need to get as much of this money into our systems as possible, and the stormwater utility can be an avenue for funding many of these things that we need because we're seeing that this is an ever growing problem in many, many. Uh, towns, no matter what state you're in. And we're not even talking about overburned communities yet, all right? That's a whole nother can of worms that we still need to address because we have some communities that don't even have the bond level to get a great interest rate on their loans that they're looking to get more infrastructure uh, funding for when you're talking about capital improvement projects. So there are some changes coming down the road that I believe can really help these most in need communities get the financing that they need from the state and federal government, but I think we can go in more detail about that later, because either way, I'll keep ranting. 
Oh, that's great. Thank you all. And so we'll, the way the flow of this panel will go is that we'll keep, we, we kind of did an introduction there of the issue. We'll dive a little bit deeper into the challenges with funding and then get to some of the solutions. So starting high level and moving a little bit more technical as we go, just for folks who may not be familiar with some of these concepts and terms. So um, I guess I'll go back to Ivan and ask, because we're in New York City with an audience probably mostly for uh, people from New York and New Jersey who may not be familiar with some of the innovative work that DC Water is doing. Can you talk a little bit about how you've started to overcome some of that financing challenge that, that, you, that you mentioned? Maybe talk about back in 2009, the fee structure that was implemented and, and help us understand how that program has kind of helped to keep um, pollutants out of, the, out of the waterways but also raise money for stormwater infrastructure. And I think that'll help us kind of understand what a stormwater fee is and what that might look like as in, a, across our own region here. Sure, thanks, Tyler. So with, uh, with the District of Columbia, uh, and I stated earlier about the, uh, the lawsuit that came and where the, we had a federal mandate, uh, we were tasked with this mandate and in 2009, we, well, let me kind of go back. And mm -hmm. in 2002, there was a settlement in which DC Water came up with a long-term control plan uh, for our Clean Rivers program. And in order to be able to fund this uh, Clean Rivers program, we went through uh, some, again, worked with rate consultants and we developed what was called a Clean Rivers Impervious Area Charge or just going by the acronyms, we call it CREAC. So this CREAC uh, is a charge that is placed on the monthly water bill. Uh, so again, that is a charge that residents uh, must pay, and it's based on an equivalent residential unit or an ERU. Uh, and that, so one ERU is equivalent to 1,000 square feet, and that and the square footage is managed by the District of Columbia. So we are an independent authority. We broke out from the the District of Columbia back in 1996, became an independent authority. And so now we still work with the district, so we're kind of like sister agencies. So we work with the district to uh, receive that information, uh, which is updated on an annual basis. So again, as, as long as we're getting that uh, square footage managed, you know, that's how we're making our charges to our customers. And it's a, uh, based on a tiered structure. So if I can't, I don't know the exacts, but if, if it's like zero to say 100 ERUs, you know, you're, you're charged one level, and then it just goes up uh, based on the square footage of your property. Uh, and that is kind of how we charge uh, for that. Now the district also has a stormwater fee that is charged, but since they don't have a billing mechanism, they place that, uh, that fee on our bill. So, so the customers will see two bills for a CREAC charge for the Clean Rivers and a stormwater fee as well. And then just kind of real quickly touching on some of the innovative programs uh, we did back in, uh, since we started this program back in May of 2009 of, of charging for customer bills, we also uh, started uh, issuing uh, what was called green bonds. So in 2014, uh, so we issue our regular, you know, whenever we have to go out to the market to issue uh, traditional bonds for all of our capital programs, uh, 2014 we implemented green bonds. So, uh, and we, from my understanding, we issued the first ever 100 year century bond back in 2014. Um, and then after that, in 2016, we went to and, and issued a, uh, an environmental impact bond, but it was a private placement uh, where we went and had, we had assistance from a company called Quantified Ventures that helped facilitate it. We were the first ever utility uh, to issue an environmental impact bond, and it was kind of mirrored after social impact bonds for recidivism, um, but it was a $25 million project that worked with the Rock Creek uh, area in Washington, D.C., covered I think maybe roughly about 20 acres, uh, but again, so you know, we have this traditional mechanism of gray infrastructure, uh, but again, this was just a mechanism to try to see uh, if we can reduce runoff um, through green infrastructure. So uh, it was a very successful program. Uh, we have not done anything like it uh, yet since that time of 2016, but it was a very interesting uh, uh, environmental impact bond that we had gone through. So we are always looking for innovative ways and structures to help fund the program. Is, you know, again, if we can't get the funding from the federal government, we have to uh, look for other ways. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And um, you know, Mike talked about in the beginning the city's ability here, at least in New York City, to do good public projects, but the challenges with doing them private. Um, and so we've been starting to think about how to model after some of these other municipalities and towns and counties across the nation that are doing similar work to Washington, D.C. I think there's 2,100 municipalities now that have some kind of stormwater rate or fee structure. Um, and we have a challenge here in New York where Ithaca is the only town that has it in, in our state, um, and there's some legal ambiguity about it, but 
maybe before we get into some of that, um, we can start off by talking about how our rates are paid here in New York City, or New York in general, um, and, and what that looks like and how we might actually already be paying for stormwater, but maybe not in the most fair or equitable way. And so um, I, I'll let Mike speak to that a little bit, and we have a slide to, to kind of help paint the picture for that too. Oh, great. Well, first is actually the key players. So maybe you can start high level for New York City. Uh, sure. So there's, there's um, uh, three entities in New York City that are sort of in charge of water rates. The water board sets those rates. Um, they're, they're political appointees to that board. Um, the Municipal Water Finance Authority um, has the authority to issue bonds to, to pay for some of the infrastructure work. And then DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, implements that and does all the construction and maintenance work on the ground. Um, but for those of you like me who live in an apartment, uh, are renters, and you've never seen a water bill, uh, this is how they're calculated. So you are charged for water basically twice, and it's by volume. So once for the water, the amount of volume coming out of the tap, there's a charge for that, and the rate is set every year by the water board. Um, and then there is a second fee for sewerage, and that fee is calculated by a multiplier, 159% of that initial charge. Um, so you're paying twice, once when it comes into your um, home and once when it goes out. Um, the sort of problem with this setup is that it doesn't capture all of that stormwater that's coming off of properties and going into that sewer system that we have to manage. And so we're all paying for management of that. Um, but there's no recognition of in, in this fee structure that that is happening. And so we're all paying for it, but for potentially the wrong people are paying for it. The people that use the most water are paying for it, not the people who's, who have the property whose who's stormwater is running off. Um, and it doesn't set up any kind of uh, potential or opportunity for a rebate through this, these, two, um, these two charges. If there's no stormwater charge, then, then how can you come in with a rebate on the, on the back end to have people manage stormwater on their private land? Yeah, right. And that's, it's funny because when, I mean, we'll get into the legislative effort to try to combat this, but it's when I, I've found that when we talk to legislators or agencies, there's a lot of excitement about incentives and discounts and, and, and the rebates that you're talking about, but there's not a lot of understanding about how you, like where that starts, and that starts with being able to charge properly, and so I think that, that point you're making is really important. Um, and then maybe I'll ask Lee to speak a little bit to what's going on in New Jersey with this. I know there was some legislative efforts to, in, in New Jersey that were similar. Um, but that didn't happen, and now there's some resources that New Jersey DEP has to help local stormwater, storm, um, sewer and water authorities to, to create these kinds of utilities. So maybe if you want to give us a little bit of insight on how this is happening in your state and what are the challenges potentially there. Yes, uh, can do. So back in 2019, the gov um, Governor Murphy's administration did pass a, uh, a law regarding uh, stormwater utilities. Now, by no means are they mandatory in the state of New Jersey, but it does allow each municipality to choose to enter into a stormwater utility if they so please. Uh, the unique thing about New Jersey is we're a home rule state, which gives a lot of power to the municipalities, the individual municipalities, to really choose what they want to do uh, within the local level. Um, so it's a lot of power centralized in each municipality to decide whether they want to do it. Now the problem here, however, is the DEP has set up a manual, a set of guidelines on if a municipality wants to move forward with in stating a stormwater utility, they tell you how to. Um, and some time ago, they've offered TA assistance through the forms of grants uh, to help with funding of feasibility studies. Um, but as money runs lower and lower from the federal government and state level, it becomes more scarce. Um, so that's actually where organizations, nonprofits, try to step into that vacuum to assist um, municipalities that are interested. Now, I was prepared to give you a story of doom and gloom today <laughs> about how no municipalities in Jersey has a stormwater utility. That was true for a while. May 17th, I literally just read about one of the first municipalities taking a step, New Brunswick. Their council had voted uh, to actually pursue a stormwater utility. Um, if all finalized, they will actually become the first New Jersey municipality to adopt a stormwater utility. Um, and we're hopeful to see you know, a positive force behind this, uh, if following through. Wow. But uh, we thought that was very interesting to read about in the news. Um, but we see that there is a huge need for stormwater utilities as you're hearing up here, because, you know, climate change is no joke. 
rainfall is becoming even further worse than it was before 10, 20 years ago. Um, and we need to be able to upscale our water infrastructure, even our gray infrastructure to handle all this flooding because we're literally seeing rivers become, sorry, streets become rivers. So that's kind of where we are in New Jersey right now. So the, sl the wheels are slowly turning, but it's starting to see they're turning nonetheless. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, when we had the, we literally had the prep call for this and that had not happened yet. It was, nope. you, it didn't even, so, that, so, so that's great. And we'll definitely have to keep track of it, of, of how that goes in New Brunswick. But um, yeah, I mean, so I, I wanna take a moment here to, to shift gears more now into some, some of the technical piece of this and talk a little bit more directly about fees and um, the challenges that we have with those because I think one thing that we realize is that messaging around this can be really complicated and um, fees, the words fees definitely tends to scare people but I think as Mike laid it out, we are paying for this already and so it, it in some ways it's good to talk about it frankly and not think about it as an added fee and in some cases it might actually lead to less, you may be paying less in your water bill um, and it can create again incentives and discounts which people seem to be excited about. I was actually also just in last week in um, St. Paul for the National Adaptation Forum and there was a panel where there was a woman from the Water Justice Alliance in New Orleans who was speaking about their efforts to implement stormwater fees. And they, are work, they did a lot of work organizing with the community and their messaging was actually around how big um, commercial developments in New Orleans are not paying for stormwater right now. So they pointed to places like the, uh, I forgot the name of the stadium, but wherever the New Orleans Saints play, the Mercedes-Benz Dome or something, Superdome, um, and the World War II Museum, these massive buildings and places that are mostly gray that are not paying for stormwater. And so a lot of their rhetoric that they found to be successful was talking about how you have these big places that are contributing obviously to a lot more impervious surfaces, but that are not paying the same level of stormwater uh, or the same water bills or, or rates that then a, a single family home or a renter w might be. And so I think that's, a, that's an interesting way to frame it. And they're, they're looking to get it passed this in their, in their city council. And, it's a little different than here, of course. Um, we're going through a statewide effort in New York, but they're working at the city council level in New Orleans, but this is happening in a lot of different places in the country, and so um, we'll shift gears, I think, a little bit here and talk a little more directly about what that might look like. So I also wanted to pull this up. This was a recent testimony from New York City's um, chief climate officer and commissioner for DEP, Rit Agarwala, and I can't see the date, but it was like in April or something, I think, so it was pretty recent. Um, it's a testimony that he gave, and I just want to read a, a couple of things that he said here. So in his testimony, he said, we, ex we expect to pay for most stormwater resilience projects with local funding sources. That is, of course, both good news and bad news, as New Yorkers will be less dependent on state or federal decisions to shape whether we achieve stormwater resilience, but the bad news is that the more resilience we want, the higher our bills will have to rise. And then in a later part of his testimony, he says, so the final conclusion I ask you to think about, this is to the council, is not just, is that, is that this is not just a tech technocratic decision. DEP cannot alone deliver stormwater resilience plan for the city. I think that goes to what Mike was saying about the limitations for what public um, entities can do. We'll need to have a much broader conversation about how much we are willing to pay, how much flooding we're willing to accept, what kinds of responsibilities and what kind of responsibilities we are willing to impose on homeowners. DEP is the right agency to offer alternatives, but these are fundamentally political questions. So let's maybe have that political conversation for a bit here and we'll have a Q&A as well. And I'd love to hear from people in the audience on how you all are thinking about this. So this is a little bit where we are. Um, there's, you know, there's projects that are happening, but certainly not enough to alleviate the flooding. Um, we would be lying if we said that that was the case. And we'd also be lying if we said that these projects weren't happening fast enough. So hearing, I'll ask Ivan from, to, to, get to, to maybe have a reaction to these comments from, from New York City, you know, um, do you see any parallels to DC and is that kind of what helped lead to the stormwater fee adoption program in, um, in DC? And maybe if you could talk a little bit about how that came into play, the community educating, the political educating that maybe had to happen to get to that. So I realize I said a lot just now, so I'll just pass it off to the rest of the panel. No, no <laughs> worries, yes, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Tyler. Uh, yes, I do see um, uh, some parallels, definitely. And, and just to let you all know, in the District of Columbia, uh, historically, DC Water has always made the effort to educate customers. Um, we've always had uh, what are co we call our town hall meetings, 
Uh, we go out to all of the eight wards. Well, historically, we, we went out to each of, we have eight wards in the district, so we would go and, um, whether it be at an elementary school, you know, a rec center, wherever it would be, we would just meet uh, the community wherever they were uh, and just try to educate everyone on, you know, water rates, sewer rates, projects that are taking place, the reason why we're charging for this Clean Rivers uh, charge, you know, so a lot of people can't see. You know, you can see those vertical structures, but those linear structures, uh, uh, oh, not structures, but the linear assets that are underground, you know, those are hidden, and, you know, people can't understand why is my bill going up. So we've tried to do everything we can from an educational standpoint. Uh, we did have, uh, we have our, um, our general manager, Mr. David Gaddis, when he came in, I believe back in 2018, he worked with our uh, communications uh, officer, Ms. Kirsten Williams, where uh, they developed a stakeholder engagement uh, group with the, so with the community. It's about a, a committee of 19 people, so they just went and, uh, you know, reached out to the community and made sure that they were having these meetings, I believe on, the, excuse me, on a quarterly basis. Uh, so again, it was just about making sure that even though we were having these separate town halls, but I think with this community engagement group, it was one of those things where we're, the community, it's not just DC water officials that are at the head of the table, it's the community who's at the table to talk about, uh, again, the rates, the sewer structure, and all those kind of things. So that was some of the things that we had kind of yeah. did with the and that's, that's really helpful, and I wonder if you might, so one other thing that comes up a lot, I think, is how to ensure that this wouldn't disproportionately affect lower income households. And so can you maybe talk a little bit about any programs that DC Water has to make sure that, that's not, that, th that this burden or these rates or fees aren't disproportionately affecting low income households? Sure, uh, and, and what we also have is what's called our Customer Assistance Program, so we call it CAP, again, a bunch of acronyms, but uh, we have our CAP program, uh, and we've had our CAP programs, I believe we started maybe back in the early 2000s. Uh, we have what we call CAP, CAP 1, we have CAP 2, and there's different structures. So, you know, we would give, uh, maybe sit for the first one, we would say four CCFs or uh, for, uh, cubic feet. We would have a discount on customers that made, you know, X amount of dollars. If you made up to 30,000, you would get, if you kept your uh, usage down, you know, below that first four CCFs, you would get a credit off of your bill. And so, like I said, we have a CAP 1, a CAP 2, CAP 3, we have a nonprofit. Uh, discount and right now we've kind of changed the suite of discounts around where we have now added a few more new programs uh, in which you know we try to do things as far as giving an additional discount so if you are again if you're at that lower tier of the income level you know we have a program where we work with uh, the Department of Energy and Environment uh, that's through the district uh, where they do verification of income they send information over to DC Water, and again, we'll provide the discount. So again, it's re-enrolling customers on an annual basis, but we do provide a credit to that CREAC uh, program for your Clean River, since it is a, a, you know, an onerous charge. It's, some customers can get up to a 75% discount on their bill. So again, we have a range of suites from income levels of 30,000 all the way up to almost 150,000. So, uh, and again, you can get that discount for that CREAC credit back uh, on your bill. So we, Again, we try to do everything we can as far as equity, making sure, again, low-income households are uh, having the lowest bills that they can. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. So it depends, like the municipality has a lot of authority over how that how the structure is set and how to create those those discounts and um, assistance programs. And I guess I'll, I'll pass it to Mike. I think we only have maybe five or so minutes before we open it up for Q&A. So Mike, if you could say, let's, let's say New York wanted to do the same thing as DC. So let's now maybe jump into the, the legal authority aspect of it here. Can you talk about where we are in New York, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and some of the confusion within the sewer and water authorities on the clarity to do something like what DC has done. Right, and uh, I think I'll, I'll use the example of New York City. I think it's illust illustrative of what's happening in the state, and I think a lot of other municipal authorities follow New York City's lead in some ways. Um, is anybody here from the city? Hmm. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> it's like half the room. All right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Well, uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm gonna explain why the city does have authority to do this and could do this today if it wanted to, and then I, I guess we'll talk about the legislation that is on the, uh, it's in committee right now as we're speaking yes. in the Senate. Um, so New York City has really broad authority, the Water Board has really broad authority under the law, and that was, there's a 2017 case in the Court of Appeals, New York State Court of Appeals, this is the highest court in New York State, uh, which said New York has, quote, unfettered discretion, unquote, to sort of um, implement water rates based on economic policy and public policy. 
And Nate Madison at the Guarini Center, he wrote a, a, a law review article this year um, pointing out that in the law, the law says that the city has um, authority to do whatever is convenient, necessary, and desirable to um, implement its sewer program. So it, it has all of these different tools and abilities that are not just like straight um, you know, water and sewerage costs. It does have these broad authorities to uh, do what is necessary for the public. And there are good reasons for the city to want to be funding its stormwater systems, its MS4 systems, for instance. Um, and the city is already doing this. And this is what, to me, makes this city's, the city has expressed some sort of um, confusion about whether it has this authority, but the city is already implementing this. Um, the city is paying for stormwater uh, out of these general funds, so we are paying, your water rates are paying for stormwater management. Um, and the city already has an incentive program, it's a pilot program for parking lots, uh, for stormwater runoff coming off of parking lots, there's a separate fee for that. Um, if the city doesn't have authority to uh, you know, it's, if the city is confused about its authority to implement stormwater rates or to uh, implement incentives for stormwater, um, then it couldn't do that. It couldn't do what it's already doing. It's also, in southeastern Queens, the city is spending $1.8 billion to separate out from the CSO system. It's, it's separating the sewers to make them separate sewer systems. And this is really good for water quality. It's really good for local flooding. It's gonna save ratepayers money. It's a great project. Everybody knows this is a great project. Um, but that's the type of funding that if New York City doesn't know if it has authority to sort of implement incentives for stormwater management, it also couldn't do that project. So the city has this sort of internal inconsistency going on of whether it has authority um, that it's already using. And it's very clear to, to me, looking at it, that the city has broad authority under the law. But it's also very clear to me that the city's already doing this. And um, if the city doesn't think that it has the authority to do this, um, if there's any confusion there, then it shouldn't be doing what it's doing. Yeah, and maybe to round out, I can say something quickly about the legislative effort that we are working together on um, with a lot of other organizations who, um, who have been at this for a long time, the SWIM Coalition, NRDC, of course, Riverkeeper, um, to Save the Sound, there's actually too many to name, but we are, we're working on a bill that we're colloquially calling Rain Ready New York. Um, and as Mike said, it's in, it's in Assembly Committee, it's in Senate Committee right now. Um, we almost lost Mike to this panel, actually, because there's another Assembly meeting that's happening, and, um, but we got, we got somebody to cover it. So there's conversations happening about um, how to clarify that authority broadly for not just New York City, but I think for, the, for all 24 of the sewer and water authorities, 24 or 22? sewer and water authorities in the state. It's 22 or 24, I don't remember. But, um, and yeah, we've, that, that, that's kind of what I was talking about when I was saying that when we meet with legislators, they're really excited about this discount and credit system, but I think it's tough to, to, to say that to them that that discount and credit of what? Like, what are you discounting and what are you crediting? It has to be off of something. And so we're, we're seeing a broad level of support for this. Um, from agencies, but also from borough presidents across New York City. So four of the five borough presidents, um, I was gonna make a comment, but I won't. Four of the five borough presidents have, you can maybe assume my comment, four of the five borough presidents have signed a letter in support of this bill. Um, we have the Albany Sewer and Water Authority in support of this bill, the Buffalo Sewer and Water Authority in support of this bill, the mayor of Albany in support of this bill. So there's a strong, level of support for something like this to happen and to clarify that authority. And what's been challenging is that the bill is actually, liter it's literally a bill that clarifies the legal authority. There's no rate structure that's defined in the, in the bill at all. It doesn't deem anything or impose anything. It's just giving the clarity to local and sewer water authorities to make those local decisions. And, and so that's kind of where the, the legislative effort is at. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that if there's, if there's curiosity or interest in supporting that effort. But but I'd say that's where it's, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Uh, just that the New York City Water Board has very broad discretion. So New York City Water Board would not just set up the amount of money, the amount of your rate, but also the structure of the rate and whether there would be a stormwater fee or incentive or something like that. So it is totally within, with this legislation or not, within the, the Water Board's authority. Okay. I don't know if anyone on the panel has any last remarks to say before we open it up for a Q&A for about 10 minutes or so. No. Nope. I'm good. Yep. Okay. Well, we have a mic here in the front. Um, so if you just want to raise your hand, we can answer some questions. 
I think we have, I think we have 10 minutes. Yeah. I see a hand here. And then I see another hand here after. Yes. Or maybe you're standing right there, so maybe you just want to start really quickly right there. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, this is really a New Jersey question. I'm wondering how you deal with um, interjurisdictional issues on this, given how tiny the jurisdiction, the municipalities are in New Jersey, and the fact that your storm runoff probably crosses jurisdictions. So that is a fantastic question, and I wish a smarter person would know that. Um, that's an inner. So that's an interagency. Um, not dilemma, but task that would be taken up. Um, but the states between Delaware, New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey do meet. Uh, they do share the river, the Delaware River right there. As you know, it all discharges right into that basin right there, unfortunately. Um, but to give you a short answer on that one, there is coordination between the different states on the emergence of certain contaminants, including stormwater discharge into these regions. Um, but a lot of my focus tends to be on the water and drink, sorry, the wastewater and drinking within the Delaware River. In New Jersey. I'm sorry. If these are municipal stormwater fees, not state stormwater fees, I'm talking about within the 654 oh, the municipalities in New Jersey. Sorry, the, the regionals uh, within the state you mean of. I, I mean the municipal water authorities, you know, given that you're dealing with 654 municipalities for a population where New York has one municipality, mm. roughly, how do, you know, New Brunswick is doing it. What happens with Highland Park on the other side of the Raritan River? What happens with, you know, whatever's the next jurisdiction down from New Brunswick on, on the south side of the Raritan? Sorry. Because the water is all going to be running across jurisdictions. Yeah, sorry, I misheard you. Sorry, I thought I said states. Yeah, so that, that's actually a bit more complicated there. <laughs> so yeah, the, the different municipalities, some have more of a regional uh, cooperation amongst each other, others not so much. There's some municipalities that do great communication amongst each other, but unfortunately you do have some where their stormwater does go right into the other town right next door, and then there's really nothing that's been done or is being done about it, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of that, because comes down to, once again, home rule. Because many of the municipalities have their own power to direct what they want to do, and there's really no oversight regionally about what the different municipalities have to do or how they're responsible to one another. So because they're so independent and so silo siloed in many cases, yeah, you tend to have cases where you have a lot of the stormwater going into different neighborhoods of different towns, and then the other towns are like, well, then you're responsible for cleaning it up, and they're like, no, we're not. Unfortunately, some have better relationships than others, but yes, because there's no state level oversight over it, there's really no push for regionalization for these kind of issues, unfortunately, unless we can get legislation to really push for it. But we're seeing a similar thing with warehouse sprawl as well, where you see some municipalities building up all these warehouses, and then the trucks go through all these other municipalities, yet, you know, there's no consequence. <laughs> Sorry about that. I thought you were talking about the states. <laughs> and I think we had one question over here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my question was about um, cars <laughs> and the cause of so much gray, you know, concrete that covers our cities. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I'm new to this issue, so just thinking it through. Obviously, the water services don't charge car owners, but shouldn't if we're talking about raising funds or people paying for externalities of their decisions, um, would, ha has that come up, like the idea of a, an extra fee on car owners, uh, some, something along those lines? Not the car owners. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Riverkeeper worked with NRDC to come up with a stormwater rate calculator. It's up on our, our, one of our websites at the moment. It's actually. Uh, the name of the website is cutthecrap.nyc. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in, our, in this, this rate calculator, there are a number of variables that you could choose from to show what a water rate would look like if you implemented a stormwater fee, if you had a stormwater credit, 
for private properties. One of the things that you can toggle on and off is um, public right-of-ways. Mm -hmm. So are we paying, are public parks paying for stormwater runoff? I know a lot of them are green, a lot of them um, don't have as much impervious surface, that's wonderful, but they all do have some impervious surface. Another thing is the DOT right-of-way. And so should DOT be paying for the roads? And should that charge come out of DOT to go to water rates to deal with all the stormwater that comes off? Um, there's, I've heard that if you were to re-green all of New York City's highways and streets, that would, be, that would end the sewage pollution problem by itself. And so that, it's about 30% of the city, I think that's this private right of way. It's a tremendous amount, and the city's doing all these, like uh, some neighborhood-wide, I think there's a presentation right now about um, cloudburst studies, but they're also doing these curbside um, inlets, they're doing some work with DOT to capture some of that stormwater. But despite the best efforts, there's a tremendous amount of stormwater running off of that. And should they be charged? That's a decision for the water board, totally within the discretion of the water board um, to charge them. And uh, you know, it's a political decision. How much, like the, the commissioner said, how much flooding are we willing yeah. to take? Yeah, I just one quick thing to add. Um, there, there is a session happening on Cloudverse right now. It's unfortunate, actually, that it's happening at the same time as this one, because I think that there's probably a lot of overlap and in interests in talking about flooding and stormwater. But there's the way that I think about it is that it, you, you can't just rely on the, the parks and on the Cloudverse projects or these pilot projects that are hopefully going to grow across neighborhoods. It has to be, it, there was a great article in the New York Times, actually, about rain gardens and the, and the value of rain gardens. And, it's like this like interconnected network, uh, and we're also advocating for the green roof tax abatement to be, re to be increased and to have more green roofs across the boroughs, because right now they're really populated just in Manhattan, and the abatement wasn't working so well, and so how can we get more green roofs? So it's this like a network of solutions, I think, and I don't know, I have a good answer to your question about cars, honestly. I don't think I'm like the right person to answer that question. I have my own personal opinions about that, but I won't share them on behalf of Waterfront Alliance. And, I, I, but I do think there has to be this network of, um, of, of solutions, and private property is a part of that, is, I think is a part of that, and I think that's what we're trying to get to here. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, yeah. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. We have a question here, and Maggie. I would just like to follow up on the question that she mentioned, because I'm from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So the question in terms of New Jersey, and not just cars, but the, uh, let's say the private property where you have a shopping mall, which is an impervious surface, you run off from that, or uh, different places that have uh, larger areas. What's happening in terms of the impervious surface and the runoff that's coming from those? Because that's going into the storm drains, into the sewers, and the same thing. So the question is what's happening in terms of that. And I have heard something about the fact that charging for by surface area uh, with in New Jersey for basically mitigating that. Can you address any of that? In the chat? I don't know. I will need to speak to that, but I could mm. talk to the uh, other thing. Yeah. So that's a good point. And that comes up in the discussion of between private and pro private and public property, right? So in the guidelines with stormwater utilities, it is one of the fee structures is uh, calculating it by the amount of stormwater produced by the property going into the storm drains and that sort, and then creating the fee out of that per like square footage. And then that would then calculate a more equitable cost benefit for the community and the property owner to kind of justify or uh, what's uh, the word I'm looking for, um, gain payment through a fee to, you know, offset the burden onto the taxpayers and the storm system. So in that respect, yes. Now what's currently being done about it, that's a bigger question because that's the political football right there because something needs to be addressed by that, uh, especially for these larger landowners like the malls you're talking about. You also have large landowners like private universities, um, as I'm trying to think off the top of my head, ooh, warehouses, right? There's a big one. So a lot of them do have to have stormwater management plans in order to get municipal approval to come into these uh, towns and that sort. So to the extent of that, that's what's being done. But we always have to find a way to find, and this is where stormwater utilities would be very beneficial, beneficial to 
come up with the fixes that all this rush, the st um, as I'm trying to think of words, stormwater runoff is having on the public sewer, right? So yes, we hold the private industries and private uh, surf impervious surfaces accountable by mandating that they have some sort of management plan, but at the same time, we need to find a way, aka stormwater utilities could be a potential way right there, to charge equitably to put it back into the community to make the improvements necessary because over time it does have wear and tear. And we have to also take into account the most overburdened communities that this affects because we're not going to see this happening in the most affluent communities, all right? So the most overburdened communities, and I'm thinking like the small to medium size as well, they don't have the taxpayer uh, basis right off the bat to take on that burn from these larger um, impervious surface areas that are coming in, right? So I'm a huge um, proponent of the SRF, the State Revolving Fund in New Jersey, to help off costs, or sorry, offset some of those project costs for capital improvement projects that could be used for basins, drain repair, you name it, I think it can help offset some of those costs right there. But that's just kind of my snapshot answer to that, because I totally agree with you. And I think we're right at time, but I want to get to Maggie's question very quickly. So <clears throat> we'll answer that question, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you, Tyler. Um, I came out of the maintenance uh, panel, so I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of ask what are the kinds of things people are, are thinking of using these funds for? Are, we, are they restricted to new construction of you know, green stormwater infrastructure? I believe in Philadelphia they're using some of it for maintenance and they've paired like with the Power Core, they've paired it with workforce development. So just curious if you guys are seeing any restrictions on what that money that can come out of a stormwater fee can be used for. You know, I wonder what's, what in they're DC. doing in D.C. where it yeah. actually is. But I'll just say for New York's, um, you know, we haven't implemented this yet, but the, the funds could potentially be used for anything. And there is no limit on what the Water Board could do. The Water Board could set those limits if it chose to. And for, the, and for the district, it is strictly for what it is. For the stormwater, it, that uh, goes to the District of Columbia. So again, that is not a uh, DC water charge. We're charging only for the uh, Clean Rivers impervious area charge. So we have dedicated funding that goes to that. So just like I said it about, we have, I don't know if you're here earlier, but uh, we have our um, dedicated green bonds. So we are issuing bonds to fund our Clean Rivers program. So we, our funds are only dedicated for those um, projects only. The fee. Uh, to my knowledge, I do not believe so, but I, I can I can follow up and I, I can get your information to follow up with you on that. Yes. Amazing. Okay. Well, we're at time. Yes. Okay. Great. So I think we. I'm supposed to know this. I think we have a break. Now. <laughs> yes, we have a break, Jake. Okay, we yeah. have a break now uh, for maybe 10 minutes or so, or 15 minutes or so. Um, so feel free to grab a coffee. Thanks, everybody. We'll be up here if you have any other questions, but thanks for, for joining this session.